Well, thank you for taking the time out of your evening to attend the first presentation in our Anti-Semitism Studies Lecture Series, featuring Dr. Jacob Scott Lewis, whose talk is titled, Unpacking the Link Between Conspiracies and Anti-Semitism. Special thanks to our co-sponsors for this event, the Weizmann Museum of American Jewish History. My name is Ayal Feinberg, and I'm an Associate Professor of Political Science and Anti-Semitism Studies here at Gratz College. I serve as the Director of the Center for Holocaust Studies and Human Rights, where I have the unique privilege of overseeing four academic programs, including the world's largest Holocaust and Genocide Studies graduate program. Today, and through this lecture series, I want to call attention to some very exciting news. Gratz College is launching America's first Master's of Arts degree program in Antisemitism Studies this fall in 2024. This groundbreaking degree will help fill this serious vacuum of antisemitism knowledge across Jewish, non-Jewish, and governmental organizations, generating both research and policy to combat prejudice at a time of unprecedented Jew hatred in the United States and around the world. I'm overwhelmingly proud to say that Gratz is now the premier institution for one to develop the expert level knowledge and skills needed to successfully combat what Robert Wistrich coined the world's longest hatred. Although we are officially fielding our first cohort for fall of 2024, thanks to tremendous interest in this program, we are able to offer anti-Semitism specific courses for those who cannot wait and would like to enroll for spring and summer. We've already accepted a handful of incredible students, ranging from those practicing social work and law, K through 12 educators, professors, returning to earn an anti-Semitism expertise to help improve the campus climate at this dire time, and those already with positions in the Jewish world, including rabbis. I genuinely believe our new MA program has the potential to not only positively impact the Jewish community, but meaningfully improve society as a whole. I want to encourage anyone, especially post 10-7, who is eager to make an impact, to consider this amazing opportunity at Gratz. I promise you, you will graduate the new MA with a deep knowledge of anti-Semitism, both historical and contemporary, as well as the critical skills needed to be empowered to combat it. This is the time for our community to invest in this education. I wanna briefly share an outline of today's festivities. First, I have the pleasure of introducing Mimi Schneirov, who is the longtime leader in the Jewish community and has served as a board member at the Weizmann National Museum of American Jewish History with distinction. She will share remarks about Gratz's growing partnership with Weizmann. Following these remarks, Dr. Jacob Scott Lewis will present a fascinating and timely lecture on conspiracies and anti-Semitism. This lecture will be followed by a Q&A. Please feel free to submit questions both during and following the presentation. After the Q&A, I will briefly provide a presentation about the motivation, need, and structure of the new MA program. I will then introduce two of our amazing Gratz graduate students, Olivia Lane and Michael Denning. Together with Dr. Lewis, we will host an open discussion about what it's like to be a student at Gratz, how Gratz has impacted their careers, and will answer any questions from the audience about the new MA program. It is with great enthusiasm I turn the floor over to Mimi Schneider. Mimi, take Thank it away. You, Thank you very much. Um, as I said, my name is Mimi Schneirov, and I am a member of the Board of Trustees of the Weizmann National Museum of American Jewish History on Historic Independence Mall in Philadelphia. For those of you who don't know, our mission at the Weizmann is to present educational programs and experiences that preserve, explore, and celebrate the history of Jews in America. Our purpose is to connect Jews more closely to their heritage and to inspire in people of all backgrounds a greater appreciation for the diversity of the American Jewish experience and the freedoms to which Americans aspire. And I, I emphasize the people of all backgrounds because I think that 
connecting Jews to their heritage, but also exploring the diversity of the Jewish people as we will be doing and are doing, and also to help other people connect to our story is going to be an important piece of what we need to do to combat anti-Semitism. We do fulfill our mission through several avenues, public programs like this one, both online and in person. And I hope you will go to our website at some point. I'll give you the, the link a little bit, but they're fabulous. And I really encourage you to, to join in them. Educational programs where we're working with students of all ages across the country and working with teachers as well. And exhibitions like our core, which walks visitors through the current uh, through the 350 years we've been here in America, but also with temporary exhibitions that are more con contemporary as well as historical. We all know how important the fight against anti-Semitism is, and especially these days. So I, I am extremely excited to announce on behalf of Gratz College and the Weitzman, the launch of the Gratz Weitzman Anti-Semitism Pedagogy Advisory Committee Fellowship. Fellowship finalists will be announced on March 15th and the program will launch in April. This partnership will advance both institutions, both institutions mission to combat anti-Semitism through education, offering Gratz graduate students who are also middle and high school teachers, the opportunity to pilot and co-author pieces of the Weizmann Museum's groundbreaking national initiatives, stories that shape a nation. Jewish Lives in America. Selected fellows will advise us, uh, on our changes and improvements based on student assessments and assist on writing pieces of a free system that will be available on our Weizmann website when it is completed. Together, the Weizmann and Gratz College will create content with proven success in combating anti-Semitism. And we'll do so by teaching the complex, joyful, and true histories of the Jewish people a place of Israel within that history and highlight the diversity within the Jewish people. Few institutions can create and then immediately assess content in an advanced academic level. And I'm convinced that this exciting partnership will allow for just that, embracing the iterative nature of education and basing our content on real data. So we are thrilled to continue a long tradition of working with our friends at Gratz College on this new wonderful fellowship the anti-Semitism lecture series, which kicks off tonight, and hopefully much more to come. So I hope you stay in touch and keep up to date with everything that's happening on the Weitzman by visiting our website, theweitzman.org, it's W-E-I-T-Z-M-A-N, and following us on social media at Weitzman Museum. And before I hand it back to Ayel, I would just like to take a point of personal privilege. You may notice a number on my chest. It's 150 and the medallion I'm wearing or the dog tag I'm wearing around my neck. It's been 150 days that hostages have been in hell in Gaza. And I just want us not to forget they're there and to remember how many days they're there and to pray that all the hostages are released as soon as possible. So now I'll hand it back to the director of the Center of Holocaust Studies and Human Rights at Gratz College, tonight's host, Ayel Harper. Thanks, Ayel. Thank you so much, Mimi, for your, your kind and important words. I really appreciate it. It's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker for tonight, Dr. Jacob Scott Lewis. Dr. Lewis, who received his PhD in government from the University of Maryland, is an assistant professor in the School of Politics, Philosophy, and Public Affairs at Washington State University. His research centers on African politics and focuses on issues of corruption, conflict, and political psychology. But importantly, he also studies issues of anti-Semitism in a comparative perspective, focusing on mechanisms of blame and the role of conspiracy theories in populism. His work has been published in some of the most well-regarded social science outlets in the world. His research has also been supported by the Carnegie Corporation of New York, the U.S. Agency for International Development, the ADL, and much more. He's also the 2024 section co-chair of political psychology at APSA. Before beginning his life as an academic, Dr. Lewis managed democratization and post-conflict stabilization programs across Africa, as well as in Afghanistan. And like me, Dr. Lewis shares a love of alpine skiing, coffee, and of course, cats. 
I also want to give a less formal introduction to Dr. Lewis, so Jacob, if I may, uh, can only be described as a rising star in the academic world. He is the recipient of high-impact seven-figure grants that most scholars can only dream of. But beyond his success in the academy and out in the field, Jacob is one of the kindest and most supportive people I've ever had the opportunity to work with. He is an incredible mentor an amazing instructor. A number of his graduate students have already gone on to placements and careers that many can only dream of. It is an honor for me to call him a co-author as well as a colleague here at Gratz College, but I'm beyond privileged to also call him a dear friend. And on that note, I'm excited to share that Dr. Lewis will be teaching an entire elective course for our pioneering MA in anti-Semitism studies degree on this very subject that he's presenting on today the nexus between anti-Semitism and conspiracy. So without further ado, I turn the floor over to Dr. Jacob Scott Lewis to discuss his critical research. Jacob. Oh, uh, well, thank you, Ayal. Um, can you confirm that you can hear me before I... I can hear you loud and clear. Wonderful, great. I'm gonna go ahead and, and share my screen and get started here. Um, okay, so, and then you can also see that, Ayal, I take it. Okay. Um, well, that was an incredible introduction, and uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm not sure, not sure to say after that, um, but I want to just start by saying how sort of honored I am to present this research um, in in this uh, sort of I don't know, lecture series. It, it, it feels incredibly flattering that I get to to begin. Uh, as I all mentioned, uh, I'm an assistant professor at Washington State University. And my interest has long been in questions of conflict and democracy and trust. And it might seem strange that somebody that primarily works on African politics would study uh, anti-Semitism, but there's actually a linkage. Um, in fact, I, I first got the interest when I was doing field work in South Africa and conducting interviews and uh, comments were made to me and perhaps the individuals didn't recognize that I, I am Jewish. And, and uh, it set off something where I realized this was something I wanted to look at. Uh, if you fast forward a few years, the rising level of normalization of anti-Semitism uh, in global um, democratic culture is, is shocking. And uh, on a personal note, my own synagogue was defaced. And so at that moment, I, I realized I needed to integrate this into my research. So... Uh, like any good academic, I, I sent uh, the title of my talk to Dr. Feinberg and then immediately changed it uh, so that way he wouldn't have the right uh, title, and that's on me. But I'm very excited to present this sort of first cut of research that I'm that I'm working on that I'm hoping will uh, move into a, a book-length manuscript. Um, so you may recall uh, in the fall of 2022, Kanye West, an incredibly talented and well-known uh, rapper and designer and artist, went on something of a rampage, um, citing, you know, that the Jews were controlling him and trying to rip him off, and Jewish doctors were medicating him with strange medications. And for those of us that were observing this, this felt like a, a real turning point. We had been living in a time where increasingly we saw fringe activists using anti-Semitic language and conspiratorial language, but here's a mainstream, very well-known individual. Now, if it were simply uh, one artist making these comments, it would be scary, but unfortunately uh, it has spread beyond that. So here's an image of uh, a right-wing uh, anti-Semitic group, the Goyim Defense League, uh, standing above a freeway, uh, doing Nazi salutes, and they have this sign, Kanye is right about the Jews. It's very rare in social science that we're able to directly con connect the comments of one individual to the behavior of the masses or e even individuals, but here we have uh, excellent evidence of that. So there is an impact that these thoughts and words have, and unfortunately, as I'm sure we're all familiar with, 
there are uh, deadly consequences. So in the bottom left, we see here the desecration of a Jewish cemetery covered in swastikas and, of course, a, a testament to the 14-word uh, oath that many white nationalists take. And then we see the targeting of Jews themselves. Uh, here we have, of course, the Pittsburgh Tree of Life Synagogue, uh, one of the sort of turning points in contemporary anti-Semitism, I believe. So we're living in this time where anti-Semitism has become normalized. And uh, for those of us that um, have an understanding of history, this is certainly a time when we are paying attention. The question that brought me to this study, and I assume the question that brings many of the viewers to this uh, webinar is, why is anti-Semitism on the rise? Well, we have a pretty good body of research on anti-Semitism today in the humanities. So if we want to understand the history of uh, religious discrimination, for example, there's, there's excellent work on that. Of course, our historical understanding of pogroms and the Holocaust is incredible. Um, and we're increasingly seeing work that looks at the relationship between anti-Zionism as a political movement and anti-Semitism as a set of held beliefs about Jews. We don't see in political science nearly as much attention paid to this, although that's changing. So we have seen, for example, influential work by Hirsch and Royden that looks at anti-Semitism across the American political spectrum. And uh, Dr. Feinberg's work uh, has shown pretty credible links between uh, when Israel engages with its neighbors and often with the Palestinians and a rise in anti-Semitic events uh, in America. As I was getting into trying to research this, what really stuck out to me is this linkage I see between conspiracies and anti-Semitism. So we recognize that anti-Semitism often has something of a conspiratorial kernel to it. It's different than other forms of bigotry. Anti-Black bigotry is based on, on false ideas of humanists and subhumanists. That's not really what we see in contemporary anti-Semitism. In fact, we generally see the idea that there's some nefarious cabal that is trying to push um, malicious outcomes on an unsuspecting population. So we can consider the Protocols of the Elders of Zion as a sort of archetype, uh, but certainly not the first uh, instance of this. These constant uh, complaints we hear about Jews controlling governments or banks uh, certainly uh, play into this narrative. And more recently, the Great Replacement Theory that argues that Jews are behind the uh, immigration of individuals from low-income countries. This has been the, the uh, inspiration for a number of shootings that have targeted not only Jews, but African-Americans. But we have a core challenge here. We notice, for example, that conspiracy theories Populism and anti-Semitism seem to float up and down together. They move together. And so we can, of course, look at the Kishinev pogrom of 1903, pre-World War II Europe, in which there's just this soup of these things mixing with one another, or even our current political climate. There's untold numbers of uh, web shows that blame the Jews for any number of ills, from COVID to immigration to, you know, whatever you want to say is the outcome you dislike, I'm sure you can find a way to blame the Jews for it. But we have a challenge if we want to take this seriously. And that challenge is causality. We simply don't know what causes what. If we recognize that anti-Semitism is a problem and that it moves with conspiracies and populism, it's incumbent on us to understand how they relate to one another causally. That's going to impact our ability to design interventions that can reduce anti-Semitism overall. So it might be that individuals that are attracted to populism and don't like elites uh, become more susceptible to conspiratorial viewpoints and adopt anti-Semitism uh, because they 
view Jews as elites or because there are just so many anti-Semitic conspiracies out there. It could be that individuals that are conspiratorially minded adopt populist frames in order to justify their conspiracies and adopt anti-Semitism because, again, views are often uh, seen in Western culture as part of the elite. It might be that individuals with latent anti-Semitic beliefs are drawn to populism and conspiracy because they enable uh, anti-Semitic um, justifications for their actions and their words. I really think it's important to essentially dedicate a line of research to understanding how these things cause one another. And so that's what I'm doing here. I'd like to spend a little bit of time getting into the academic weeds with you, and I hope you'll bear with me as I do so. I'm going to talk about the survey experiments that I've run to try to test out ca different causal pathways, who I tested, and how I tested. So it it's probably behooves us to look at what a survey experiment is. Think of any survey that you've ever been asked to fill out, whether that's the U.S. Census that comes every 10 years or a market research survey, something that comes to your phone or your email. Maybe somebody's asked you in person, come to your door and ask to, to take a census demographic. Surveys usually have a core set of questions. They ask demographic questions about an individual. They ask questions about broad sociopolitical views. And then they ask about, um, you know, views or your opinions of the thing they're really interested in. And I'm really interested in populist views, anti-Semitism, and conspiracies. Now, there's nothing experimental about what I've told you so far. But what if we insert into a survey some sort of partisan news story or a vignette that makes an issue more salient? that primes us to think about something or reintroduces to our, our um, awareness some big political topic. If we do that in the middle of a survey, might it be that we affect the responses that, uh, to questions that are asked after that treatment? Well, that is the core logic of a survey experiment. And when we use this if we uh, use a control, we can actually look at the differences in responses to people that got a news story about conspiracies or a news story about local infrastructure or a baseball game. And if there are major differences in their responses, we can uh, come to the conclusion that exposure to certain types of news might actually activate certain outcomes. And so that's what I'm going to do here. I've developed a survey experiment that stacks three uh, treatment junctures. And so I begin by asking everybody the same set of questions about who they are and what they believe. And did you vote for the Democrats or the Republicans? And any number of questions that you could put on there. And then I have three different uh, news vignettes that I ask uh, each respondent to examine. But what they don't know is that they are at, at each junction, they, are, they have a 50% chance of either reading a control or a treatment. And so these treatments talk about anti-elite uh, behavior, and that's designed to evoke populist sentiments. Uh, the second talks about conspiracies. And the third talks just talks about making Jewish Jews salient. And then after this, I ask a set of questions about anti-Semitism, populist beliefs, conspiracy beliefs, etc. And so because there are three opportunities to either receive a control or a treatment, we have some individuals that received all three controls, and we have some individuals that received all three treatments, and everyone in between received some sort of mixture of them. I'd like to show you what the conspiracy treatment looks like. So... The conspiracy treatment talks about the World Economic Forum and specifically its plan for a great reset, which emerged right during the COVID pandemic. 
This generated a huge number of left-wing and right-wing conspiracies. Conspiracies like they're going to force us to get vaccinated, we're going to have to eat bugs, the World Economic Forum will take over the sovereignty of our country. And so what you see is this very interesting prompt that will activate in the, in the theory or the logic of this design, both left-wing and right-wing conspiratorial spidey sense, you might call it. And so I gathered two real tweets, and this is one of them here on the left that says that the assassination of Shinzo Abe was actually a World Economic Forum special operation, right? And uh, the idea was in a few paragraphs to discuss the World Economic Forum as well as the conspiracies it doesn't endorse the conspiracies. It was a completely factual treatment, but it introduces them into the, the atmosphere. I also have these survey treatments. One is designed to generate populist sentiments by talking about elites and the way in which congressional stock trading bills, especially those designed to regulate stocks, are often shut down uh, by members of both parties. And these are written to be bipartisan. In fact, it's not hard to do that because uh, depending on who's in charge, there's always a Republican or a Democrat that introduces a bill and there's always a Republican or a Democrat that uh, comes to uh, stymie that bill. In fact, it's a great point of bipartisan uh, commitment to stymie these bills. I also have a treatment that makes Jews more salient. So it talks about Jewish immigration to America and how that contributed to Hollywood and Broadway. And I have pictures of Sasha Baron Cohen, a white presenting Jew, and David Diggs, a black presenting Jew, because I wanted to ensure that I wasn't um, smuggling any, any sort of um, uh, ethnic stuff as well. And importantly, I don't include any conspiracy here, because it's important that I don't have conspiracy in both my treatment and the outcome. I want to see if one affects the other. So I wanted to uh, have 2,000 Americans respond to this, and I specifically split it or stratified it between voters for Donald Trump and voters for Joe Biden in the 2020 election. I stratified it this way because online samples are often very young and very left-leaning, and I wanted to ensure that I had a more representative sample of the partisan ideology across America. So I have 928 respondents that voted for Joe Biden and 925 that voted for Donald Trump. Within the sample, I have 919 individuals that identify as male, 890 that identify as female, 36 that identify as non-binary or third gender, and four that refuse to uh, identify their gender. So, I want to begin by looking at three different pathways. The first pathway, as I identified, is exposure to conspiracies should generate anti-Semitic beliefs and populism. The second is that exposure to populism should generate anti-Semitism and, uh, and conspiracy beliefs. And the third is that exposure to Jews might uh, generate anti-Semitic anti -Semitic and, I'm sorry, uh, populist and conspiracy beliefs. Now, I'll, I'll give you a spoiler. I don't actually find that populism has any causal impact on my outcomes. That might be, bec be because of how I wrote the question, or it might be that it is simply not a causal effect. Basically, more study is required. But I'd like to start with the first pathway. Do conspiracies evoke anti-Semitic belief? I'm going to begin by evaluating Jewish political control. And then I'm going to look at economic control. And then finally, I'm going to look at questions of free speech. So the first outcome is measuring respondent evaluations of Jewish political control. And the question is, for each of the following groups, and I test six groups in total, please rate how much influence or power they have over American politics and the political system. I have a five-point scale that goes from none at all to too much, and too much is quite deliberately in there because it's a normative statement that it's not just that they have a lot of control, but that they have more control than they should. They have too much control. 
So let's take a look at some bar plots. And these are the average uh, treatment effects that we find. In orange, these sort of orange bars that you see, these are the average evaluations of Jewish political control for individuals that did not receive a conspiracy vignette. And now I'm going to show you what it looks like if people did receive the conspiracy vignette. We have first, overall, a slight increase uh, in the full sample. And this is significant at a 90% confidence interval, just slightly less than we generally look for uh, in the social sciences, but still suggests that there is something important to be learned. For voters for Joe Biden, we also see an increase in evaluations of Jewish political control that is also statistically significant. For voters of Donald Trump, while it looks like there is an increase, it is not statistically significant. So what this suggests is that uh, voters for Joe Biden are responsive to making conspiracies salient to them, and they are more likely to then increase their evaluations of Jewish political control. I then move to economic control, which is the exact same question, but with economic language rather than political language. And I have the same scale. And what we find here is remarkably ro are consistent with my first set of findings. So uh, after exposing people to information about conspiracies in the full sample, we see an increase that is significant at the 95% confidence level. This is generally considered the standard conventional level of st statistical um, significance. And again, this is mostly found within voters for Joe Biden. So again, individuals that voted for Joe Biden when exposed to conspiracies are, are, suddenly have higher evaluations of Jewish economic control. Once again, we do see an increase for in voters for Donald Trump, but we can't say that they're statistically distinct from the control. Okay, now I want to turn back to free speech because you may recall I started by talking about Kanye West, whose whole proclamations were that Jews were trying to control what he said. So Kanye was talking about the idea that um, Jews are uh, sort of so massively part of the entertainment industry, they can control his finances, control what he can and can't say. Now, you might say th they're doing a terrible job, given that he was going on all sorts of podcasts, decrying the Jews and talking about his love of Hitler. But, you know, never let logic get in the good way of a in the way of a, of a good conspiracy. So in order to measure this, I didn't ask individuals to endorse specific claims, but rather ask them to, met, to tell me how many claims they agree with. And the idea here is that this might be a very sensitive thing for people to talk about. Uh, we often worry about something called social desirability, which is that people want to give you an answer that makes them look good, right? So I asked five, I, I gave them five statements and said, Simply tell me how many of them you agree with. You can agree with zero, one, two, three, four, or five. The first three, you'll see here, are designed to be relatively um, benign. It's difficult to have a discussion about sensitive issues these days. People are often too sensitive when discussing politics and society. You'll notice those are very similar to one another. And then the third is it's important to, that we be able to express our ideals for ideas for democracy to thrive. These seem to me not to be majorly um, contentious. And I assume that people on both the left and the right would probably agree. Now, here's where we get into some of the more sensitive questions. It's impossible to criticize groups like the Jews without being canceled. And finally, the media conspired to cancel Kanye West for his opinions. So, if it is the case that exposure to conspiracy increases anti-Semitic beliefs, we should expect to see a higher, on average, number of, uh, of items that are endorsed by people that have received the conspiracy treatment than those that did not. So, I'm presenting to you all eight 
of our different combinations of treatments. And what we find is that across the board, with one exception, those individuals that received a conspiracy treatment, they're highlighted in this sort of teal, turquoise blue, have higher overall evaluations or endorsements of these, of these um, statements. Okay. So we've just talked about pathway one. Now pathway two, again, I don't find anything. So let's look at pathway three. Exposing people to information about Jews and does that shape their conspiracy beliefs? And I all, I'll need you to just tell me um, uh, how I'm doing on time as I move forward. You're doing excellent, Jacob. You have at okay. least uh, 10 minutes. Great. Okay. So I'm now going to look at how exposure to that vignette about Jews, which has nothing to do with conspiracies, uh, affects um, uh, beliefs or endorsements of conspiracies. I start with COVID-19 conspiracies. And the first that I look at is the idea that COVID-19 was intentionally created to control normal Americans, right? Or sorry, purposefully overemphasized to control normal Americans. What we see here on the left are supporters of Donald Trump and on the right supporters of Joe Biden. And what I find, oh, and sorry, my second, I'm sorry about that. My second conspiracy is that not only was um, COVID overemphasized, but it was actually planned. It was created. And again, on the left, uh, we have supporters of Donald Trump and on the right, supporters of Joe Biden. What I find here is that the partisanship is reversed. So those individuals that receive the Jewish vignette, if they are voters for Donald Trump, are more likely to endorse these conspiracies. And voters for Joe Biden, there's no change. So whereas the first pathway seems to be receiving support on the political left, now we see support on the political right. I also look at something like globalist conspiracies, a term that we all have heard recently, I suspect, and is often coded as being about Jews. So we have the idea of the, the World Economic Forum's Great Reset, as well as the idea that September 11th was planned by the US government. Here we find that um, the World Economic Forum Great Reset does not seem to speak to supporters of Donald Trump, but does slightly speak to supporters of Joe Biden. We see no effects with the September 11th uh, was an inside job uh, conspiracy uh, belief. Finally, I looked at uh, beliefs about Ukraine. We have two competing um, potential ideas about uh, the Ukraine war. One is that, Ukra this is more of a right wing one, the one is that uh, Ukraine, the, the war in Ukraine is designed to punish Russia for just being such a great paragon of Christianity and, and essentially whiteness. And the, le and the second is the, a more left-wing uh, conspiracy that Ukraine is, the, the war in Ukraine is actually a form of American imperialism uh, against Russia because Russia stands up against America. What I find is that uh, supporters of Donald Trump do uh, significantly increase their endorsement of this uh, after being exposed to information about Jews. And supporters of Joe Biden do not seem to. And then for the imperialism one, I don't see any major results here. So I'd like to discuss what this is and hopefully I'll make, make it within the next eight minutes. The core findings here is that we once again have evidence of a strong relationship between anti-Semitism and conspiracism, but of course that's what generated this study. Specifically, I find two major pathways. On the left, merely mentioning conspiracies increases perceptions of Jewish power, and on the right, making Jews salient increases endorsements of conspiracies. Now, I've actually run six studies for this paper that I'm developing. I've shown you one. I'm going to quickly talk about another one because I think it's interesting and, and gets into this. So the first question is always, are these robust results? You know, it's totally possible that I just got a weird sample. I got a blip. And I wouldn't want to make assumptions or inferences about uh, a single study that could have just been a product of time or whoever got the invitation, etc. But I was also interested because 
we don't see any independent conspiracy effects on the political right. That seems strange given how prevalent conspiracies are on the political right this day, these days. So a few questions could come up. One might simply be conservatives are not triggered by conspiracies. But again, that wouldn't explain why we see them uh, thriving in certain parts of the right. Or the other might be that conspiracies are often coded as Jewish uh, in certain parts of the right. Now, I want to note that I've run uh, additional tests for uh, people who are consider themselves moderate and liberal using different conspiracies, but I thought this was an interesting one given my time constraints. So I measured 1,069 American conservatives using an online panel, and there are a number of conditions. The first is individuals just get a control. They don't get any sort of news at all. They just answer what seems to be a normal survey. Then I have five, or sorry, four conspiratorial prompts. One is about COVID, and the other is about COVID, uh, specifically talking about Jewish control and Jewish origin of it. Another is about Ukraine. And then the, the, the fourth is about Ukraine, but really uh, talking about how it was pro probably a product of, of the Jews. So what do I find there? Well, um, let me back up and say, there are two core things I want to look at, given my question on the right. One is, um, is it a matter of exposure to conspiracy versus a control? Or is it a matter of conspiracy versus anti-Semitic conspiracy? And so what we see here are my uh, initial results, and I'm kind of working on them still, so it looks a little less polished. Uh, on the, the left panel is evaluations of Jewish economic control. The right is Jewish political control. The first orange bar uh, to the left is... Um, those individuals that were exposed simply to the control, uh, the control uh, treatment, we might call it. And then we move to individuals that received a non-anti-Semitic conspiracy. And it's replicated again for the political panel here. And what I find is that um, relative to the control, exposure to conspiracies, to, again, does not generate uh, increased evaluations of Jewish political or economic control. So this is uh, this is consistent with my first study. But if we look at uh, non-anti-Semitic versus anti-Semitic coded conspiracies, we do see a very large and statistically significant rise in evaluations of control. And this replicates itself with political control. So this begins to unpack why we might see different partisan level effects. I think the implications here are quite broad, okay? First of all, we live in a time that increasingly favors misinformation. I deal with it with my students. We have social media. We have alternative news sites that push misinformation. And misinformation is frankly more fun and more attractive for low attention information consumers to consume. We also see a mainstreaming of anti-Semitic rhetoric. So in the post 10-7 era, we've certainly see, seen quite a bit of linkages between anti-Zionist statements and broader anti-Semitic statements. And I'll give you an example. Uh, recently, uh, a Harvard professor had to step down from his participation in a pro-Palestinian solidarity group because they included in their flyer this blatantly anti-Semitic uh, cartoon. You see a hand with a Magen David and it's it's sort of choking or, or puppeteering um, uh, Africans and Arabs. Uh, and so, you know, what we see here is this sort of bleed between criticism of Israel and just the use of essentially anti-Semitic conspiracies. We also see open neo-Nazism increasingly um, uh, connected with conservative activism. So at the most recent CPAC, this is a blurry photo because it's from a video, we see a number of individuals that openly identify as neo-Nazis, one of which is giving the salute, the Nazi salute, specifically 
to troll the young journalist who's at that desk right there. All of this is to suggest that we live in a critical moment and it really matters how we move forward. So one way we can address this is through formal education. And, you know, in the context of, uh, of a lecture series about the MA program at Gratz, I think there are a few things we can highlight, right? How can an, an anti-Semitism masters rise to this pretty challenging moment that we're in? Well, I think there are three ways. The first is that it can promote critical information uh, literacy that can reduce the uptake of misinformation. The second is that we can really teach the historical and social scientific knowledge that we need to understand political anti-Semitism, not just as something that emerges epiphenomenally from you know, economic conditions, but rather as really a, a strategy that gets used by certain individuals. And third, promoting an intelligent discussion about Israel without relying on anti-Semitic canards. That is all the more important in a time when we see certain segments of activists unable to do so. Thank you so much for your attention. Um, I have put my email here if anybody's interested in speaking further about this. Um, and please feel free to reach out to me. Um, and I all, I'm just gonna give it uh, back to you. I'm gonna end my, my share. Well, Jacob, thank you so much for an incredible presentation. Uh, this is such timely and important work and a huge round of applause for uh, taking up uh, this really, this needed mantle at this moment. So so thank you. Uh, I'm opening up the floor now to Q&A. You can post any questions that you have in the Q&A. I see we already have one uh, question, but I'm gonna take point of privilege here for just a second. And I wanna ask you, how can we understand the implication of these two different pathways that you've identified? And does it matter that we observe different pathways on the left and the right? Um, well, thank you, Ayal. Um, okay, there, so there's two questions there and I'll just try to tackle them. Okay. How can we understand the implications of this? Well, If we back up and make this more of a running jump and not just a standing jump, the implications of this for political science are pretty dire, I would say. Again, we live in a time when you can observe quite openly on both the left and the right a mainstreaming of nakedly anti-Semitic um, uh, rhetoric. And so the implications, I think, they speak to academics, they speak to policy individuals, but they also speak to us as citizens who care about living in a liberal democracy. Uh, Jews are often considered the canary in the coal mine. So when anti-Semitism springs up, it is often the case that anti-Black racism emerges. We see uh, movements to you know, suppress um, LGBT communities, all of this is stuff we can we can observe right now. And so the implications, I think, are are quite broad. Now, in terms of the pathways, right? So right, finding these different pathways is interesting interesting because it speaks to different underlying mechanisms or ethos within each, you know, whether you want to call them parties or groups of people. But we also have to recognize that in the conspiracy world, they all sort of meet each other at one point. So I think a great example of that was the, the way in which the distinction between very far right and very far left conspiracies is very small, right? Uh, you can find a, a neo-Nazi style comic of you know a Jewish hand controlling media, or you can find a, a, a left-wing um, uh, comic or cartoon of a Jewish hand controlling, um, uh, you know, people of color and, and immigrants. Um, but both of them speak to the same, the same sort of core. 
And you can even see that like I recently uh, came across, I didn't include it in the, in the um, slideshow though, perhaps I should have. Uh, somebody used AI to generate an image of immigrants coming over the border of the Southern border of America. And they managed to, you know, they put the immigrants so that way they, it looks like a Jewish stereotypically Jewish face, right? Like that is actually not all that different from that left-wing um, uh cartoon of a jewish hand controlling yeah. controlling um black and, and arab individuals so you know the, there are the implications for policy are that we have to attack them differently we have to ha develop in interventions that speak to the mechanisms that we still need to uncover but we also have to recognize that at the core of this uh they they meet together Thank you so much for that answer, Jacob. I, I really do appreciate it. Um, we have several questions coming in. Uh, I want to get to one that that occurred during the first study that you shared. Uh, mm -hmm. One of our attendees noted that perhaps most Trump voters already believe in conspiracy theories. So giving the conspiracy treatment to the Trump group didn't have the impact that we might have expected or that it did for the Biden group. Could you just respond to that comment? Absolutely. So um, I see that that is from uh, Mark Hager, I'm going to say is the last name. Uh, what you're talking about in experimental uh, uh, methodology, we talk about ceiling or floor effects, right? And so what you bring up is is critical to understanding this, right? Um, it might simply be that belief in conspiracies is already so high that it doesn't, we, we're not really triggering very much. And that was what that second uh, study was trying to look at is why why am I not seeing this? Um, what's interesting is that even though there's an effect with voters for Joe Biden, even those that have have been affected and, and by the conspiracy or or Jewish vignette, they report lower endorsements of conspiracies or Jewish political behavior, Jewish political control <laughs> than even the non-affected voters for Donald Trump. So I think I'm just going to be forward and say, Mark, Mark, I think you're absolutely right. Um, it's very difficult to test for floor or ceiling effects. So that is sort of what I was going for in that second study. Uh, and I'm currently designing a set that go a little bit further. Um, uh, but thank you so much. That's an excellent question or comment. Thanks, Jacob. Uh, we have a, a um, question from Dr. Manaz Afridi, who's an affiliate faculty of Gratz, incredible faculty. Um, she says, hi, I appreciate your data. I wonder if you could do more on religious groups and anti-Semitism. Uh, for example, she is a Muslim who teaches the Holocaust and anti-Semitism, and she would like to see data on American different religious groups. Thanks. That's a great question. Uh, thank you, Dr. Afridi. Um, I mentioned when I talked about economic and political control, I mentioned very briefly and then did not go into it at all, uh, that I include a total of six groups, Jews included. Three of them are, are what we might call ethnic groups. Um, and then three are religious groups. So if we're talking about religious groups, I also ask about uh, Muslim Americans as well as evangelical. Americans. Uh, with the ethnic groups, um, uh, we have uh, white Americans, black Americans, and Asian Americans. The idea here was simply because I wanted to make sure that the effect was uh, specific to Jews rather than simply generating certain amounts of out-group out malice or in-group favoritism, um, uh, and, and, or, or simply that there isn't some sort of exposure effect that causes you to just think everybody is more or less powerful. And so I wanted to make sure I got, you know, some ethnically coded, some religiously coded. Jews are a strange group there because they kind of code with both, but I, I include them in the religiously coded because I think that's how most Americans think about them. What I find is that it is only Jews or it is only evaluations of Jewish economic and political control that are affected. We don't see any statistically uh, significant impacts on evaluations of other uh, other groups. Um, I don't know if that answers the question, but it's a it's an incredibly uh, astute question. Thank you, Jacob. 
We have uh, a guest, Marinus, uh, appreciates your talk. He's researching the radicalization of several New Zealanders during the 1930s economic crisis, become active conspiratorial anti-Semites. Each of them were not meaningfully anti-Semitic before they are red-pilled. Each are nominally Christian, but are not actively religious. He's seeing a pattern where first they come to believe that sinister, sinister forces are at work in an overwhelming crisis. Then they quickly rationalize this by adopting a belief in Jewish world conspiracy. Uh, he notes this is often uh, positioned as an activation of latent beliefs that see the conspiracy as providing continuity within the New Testament and the idea that evil forces are at work and they are Jewish in character. Any thoughts on this important uh, comment? Yeah, I'm, and I'm reading the, I was reading along with it. Um, I would say my response is threefold. The first response is, um, I all make sure you send my email to him or <laughs> her, um, uh, because I would be very, very interested in, in learning about your research. Um, the second is that everything you've just said seems to me to be quite active in the American and European sort of political uh, uh, environment right now, which is that a lot of people who don't seem like um, particularly observant Christians have adopted the mantle of a sort of neo-Christian nationalism that integrates uh, into it everything he, he or she has just mentioned. Uh, and, and so... You know, Nicholas Fuentes is a great example of what that might look like um, in the American context. Um, and where's oh the oh the third the third response to that speaks to something like why does it seem to be that conspiracies can begin not anti-Semitic and end quite anti-Semitic? So yeah, QAnon is a great example of something that. We can trace precisely where it begins, and it has nothing to do with Jews. And you fast forward, you know, fast forward the tape um, uh, a few months, and now it's about, you know, Jewish devil worshippers eating babies, right? And that seems ridiculous to say, except for that it's also one one permutation of the QAnon belief system. Um, so to answer that, I would, uh, first of all, so really encourage you to get in touch with me. I have a grad student with whom I'm working on that this summer, trying to figure out what, are, like, what are the junctures where we see, like, is it certain, is it certain um, actors that inject anti-Semitism into it? Is it just that there's just so many anti-Semitic conspiracies that when you're in that world, you just bump into them, right? That kind of speaks to pathway number two, for which I didn't, uh, or I, I guess pathway number two and pathway uh, number one, one of which I didn't get a lot of support for, the other I got quite a bit of support for. Thank you, Jacob. Um, and I will make sure to share your your email. I know you had already placed that, um, but anyone interested in reaching out to you can also reach out to me at afeinberg at grads.edu. Uh, we have time for one more question. I know there are a few questions that won't be answered. I apologize for that. But again, Jacob has kindly shared his contact information and we've collected these questions. So uh, he might be able to respond to you if you reach out to him. Uh, this is from uh, Liz Berger. I think a very astute question here. Uh, did you observe or record the typical sources of news that participants typically use? Do you have plans to loop in the confluence of the news and entertainment sources with conspiracy and anti-Semitism? That's a really excellent question. Uh, the answer is yes. And then the second answer is I haven't yet run the models on this. So uh, in the pre-treatment section, I include questions about sources of news. Um, but my second answer is I haven't gotten to the point where I've analyzed that. Um, that's just something I plan to do when I have a little bit more time, essentially. Um, but I would imagine, well, I, I don't even want to conjecture what I would imagine. It, it is very interesting, and and um, I'm hoping to be able to write something about it. Excellent. Well, huge round of applause to you, Jacob. We so appreciate uh, you taking the time to share this very insightful, very timely presentation on, on a topic that is of critical importance to us now. Uh, before people depart, 
Uh, I want to remind everybody that for those interested in learning more about the MA and anti-Semitism studies, I am now going to be hosting a brief panel with two graph students uh, that are going to be discussing a bit more about their experience, and I'm going to be sharing a brief presentation on some expectations associated with the MA and anti-Semitism studies, so please stick around for that. Uh, for those that are leaving, I want to thank you for your presentation, I mean, for your participation and attendance. I also want to remind everyone that this amazing lecture was only the start to a series of programs that Gratz is offering. Um, Gratz is going to be offering on March 12th, that's next Tuesday, a webinar forum featuring Dr. Amy Elman, titled October 7th, Sexual Violence, Denial, and Defamation. I've heard Dr. Amy Elman speak on the subject several times, and I can tell you that attending this lecture should be mandatory if you are really seeking to understand anti-Semitism today. I'm also excited to share that on April 2nd, for those that are living in greater Philadelphia area or those willing to travel to Philly, we're happy to host you as Gratz uh, is going to be uh, celebrating the launch of the new MA in anti-Semitism studies. Uh, it's going to feature, that night is going to feature world-renowned NYU scholar Avi Noam Pat, who will be presenting a lecture on responses to anti-Semitism studies. We will also have dessert, some, um, some hors d'oeuvres. To register for these events uh, and more, um, please make sure to look at the MA in Anti-Semitism Studies uh, website. On the bottom, you will be able to find a link to our anti-Semitism lecture series, and there uh, is all the information you need to register. I'm also going to place a link in the chat for those that are still with us. Um, if you are interested in learning more about the MA in Anti-Semitism Studies and what it's like being a part of the Gratz community, again, please stay on right now as we begin that discussion. And again, uh, thank you, Jacob, uh, for this really timely and important presentation. So without further ado, I'm going to give a few details about the new MA in Anti-Semitism Studies that you might not be able to find on the internet. Uh, then I'm going to turn the table over to two incredible grad students, uh, Olivia Lane and Michael Denning, who I'm going to introduce now before we get started. Hopefully their amazing background will keep you on. Olivia Lane is an advocate who is deeply committed to raising awareness about anti-Semitism and promoting Christian education. Raised in Dallas, her educational journey began with classical homeschooling and eventually receiving her Bachelor of Arts in Psychology from Criswell College in Dallas, Texas. In her professional life, Olivia currently serves as the Grants Coordinator at Passages Israel, a nonprofit that takes Christian college students to Israel. After her third visit to Israel in 2022 and engaging in humanitarian aid work in Ukraine, Olivia decided to take her commitment to the next level. She is currently pursuing a master's degree in Holocaust and Genocide Studies from Gratz College. Her goal is to ensure that this crucial part of history is not forgotten and that Christians learn from their past so not to repeat it. So thank you, Olivia, for joining us. I also want to introduce Michael Denning. Michael Denning is a career teacher and educator who is a third-year doctoral student in Holocaust and Genocide Studies at Gratz College. His primary areas of research include Holocaust education, ethics in the Holocaust, anti-Semitism, and commemoration. During a career that has spanned more than three decades, Michael has taught at Tufts University, St. Andrew's School in Delaware, and for the past 26 years at Noble and Greenaw School, where he served as the head of the high school from 2014 to 2023. Michael has also served on uh, trustee and advisory boards of several educational institutions, foundations, and NGOs, including the Meadowbrook School, City Year, the African Leadership Academy, the Stepping Stone Foundation, the ADL, and Facing History and Ourselves. Thank you so much, Olivia and Michael, for taking the time to answer questions of our potential students. Really, really appreciate it. Very, very quickly, before we get to our round table here, I'm just going to share my screen and go over a few quick slides about the MA program.
I'm assuming everybody can see my slides and hear me okay. Okay, excellent. It goes without saying to many, but I still think it's important to share this. This quote from Dara Horn was from prior to 10-7. And it's important to note that the motivation for this MA, the construction of this MA, also began prior to 10-7. Dara Horn, in an infamous Atlantic uh, article that she wrote back in April, said, I have come to the disturbing conclusion that Holocaust education is incapable of addressing contemporary anti-Semitism. In fact, in the total absence of any education about Jews alive today, teaching about the Holocaust might, be, might even be making anti-Semitism worse. Now, many of us in the Holocaust and genocide studies world take this quote um, as not being reflective of existing evidence that clearly shows a relationship between Holocaust and genocide education and the reduction of anti-Semitic attitudes, beliefs, and tropes. But nonetheless, the core point of what Dara Horn is saying here remains valid. Whatever we are doing, whether it's successful Holocaust education and genocide work, it is not sufficient in providing a safe and supportive atmosphere for Jews in the education space, and unfortunately now in the broader community. This is the motivation for this MA. It's born out of a need to provide a more prosperous future for Jews, but also to repair and to create a better future for society, broadly speaking. I have some bullet points here about the MA and anti-Semitism studies and why we need it, but I'm gonna share just some insight from conversations that I've had with partners over the last month as we have begun launching this program. Every single expert that we've interviewed, that we're working towards partnering with, I've asked the question, where did you learn about anti-Semitism? Where did you develop your knowledge that allowed you this amazing position in the anti-Semitism world? Without fail, I've received the same answer. I've learned about anti-Semitism on my own and through the decades of experience that I've had in this position. This is not tenable. There needs to be an academic home there needs to be a degree program where formal anti-Semitism knowledge and training is provided at an expert level, where individuals aren't just reading books or research that's not curated, but instead that they're in a learning environment where they are being instructed by the best faculty in the world on this subject. Here at Gratz College, with the creation of this new MA in anti-Semitism studies, we've created the environment where people can actually go to learn the deep knowledge, the foundational knowledge, the history, the theory, to be as impactful as they can, whether it's through education, research, advocacy, when it comes to anti-Semitism and prejudice more broadly, but also to learn the skills, to learn how to measure anti-Semitism, how to design amazing experiments so we can assess this rigor rigorously and empirically, like what Dr. Lewis presented to us today. The MA in anti-Semitism studies is about empowering students to be able to make a real impact. And I'm most excited about this for the students of this new MA. Uh, so just a brief overview about the program. The MA is a 36 credit program. Uh, we are going to allow students to either do a final project or a thesis, depending on the track that they take and what their professional aspirations are. Of course, this will all be done under my guidance and I'm help, happy to help. And I expect to be a part of everybody's advisement throughout. Here's what makes this program particularly exciting. And all of the experts that I spoke to are really thrilled to see that we've created three possible concentrations for students to, to learn and to focus on. Research, 
teaching, and advocacy. We ask that students end up choosing two of three of those concentrations. Research really prepares students with data skills necessary to engage in academic quality research like what was presented today, examining contemporary antisemitism and also comparatively. Uh, teaching, this focus is about engaging students on antisemitism pedagogy, focusing on curriculum development, program design and intervention assessment and advocacy training students on community and organizational approaches to combating antisemitism. What does this mean? Well, for those that are in these combined research and teaching tracks, I can see many of those students going on to get continued graduate work. In fact, even doctoral programs, working in education or in higher education, working in museum spaces that desperately need this expertise. Those in the advocacy and research track civil rights organizations, think tanks, government and public policy, and those in the nonprofit world, DEI, synagogue, Jewish community, the teaching and advocacy pairing is probably what's best for you. But what's amazing is that in this MA, you can pick and choose the electives that you think are gonna best help you professionally. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. I'm happy to answer more questions on the administrative front. Um, but I really want to open the floor to Olivia and Michael. Again, thank you for taking the time um, to speak with us today. Let's start off with, and, and let me also share, share in the Q&A, if there's any questions, uh, please, for, for Michael, for Olivia, for myself, please uh, be sure to include those now. But why don't we just start off with a softball to both Michael and Olivia for those unfamiliar with grads, describe the best elements of our institution. Uh, go ahead, Olivia. Olivia, please. Okay, great. Um, yeah, wow, there's so much to cover. Um, I, I'd say first and foremost, um, you know, when I was looking for a place to get my master's in Holocaust studies, I there's there's nothing really else out there like Graz. Um, you know, I work full time, I commute over an hour into the office. So for me, it's really hard to um, maintain a work and school schedule. So the asynchronous model of Gratz was really appealing. And honestly, I, I probably wouldn't have been able to get my master's had it not been for that flexibility that's offered. Um, so that's just one element that I, I really, really appreciate. Another one I'd say is, um, the diversity of, of the student body has been um, really, really amazing. I find myself getting into discussion board posts and talking to people and you find just the most amazing people who have so much experience and as to somebody who's um, new to this world, it's been really, really helpful to um, learn from my classmates and from my professors. And then lastly, I'd say, this is gonna sound like a small thing, but the use of Canvas, I think learning over a computer can be really overwhelming for a lot of people. And I, even though I'm Gen Z, can be a little bit um, technologically lacking. So uh, the use of Canvas is super efficient. And um, I mean, even I worked as a TA in my undergrad, and I've just been so thankful for the way in which all the courses are set up online to be super easily accessed. So that's been helpful. Thanks so much, Olivia. Uh, Michael, anything to add? Thank you, Olivia, and good evening, everyone. And Ayel, thank you for this opportunity. It really is a, an honor and a privilege to talk about my experience uh, at Gratz. Uh, as Ayel said, I'm a career educator um, in my fourth decade of this work. And uh, and throughout my career as a teacher and as a school leader and, and as a community leader, my passions and, and concerns have been one and the same, which is to try to create the most effective educational process for folks living in a liberal democracy. I'm, I'm reminded, I remind my students all the time that we live in one of the only places in at one of the only times in the history of the world where we have the privilege to govern ourselves and all the responsibility that goes with that. And, and so my attraction to Holocaust studies was always, um, and to anti-Semitism was always um, to try to honor and commemorate uh, the survivors and to care for the 
uh, and the victims and the victims and the survivors and to care for the survivors as best we can. Um, but as I got more deeply into this work and started to understand the impact of 1900 years of Christian anti-Judaism, anti-Semitism, to understand the reality of a collapsed democracy. You know, so many people think that Hitler seized power in some sort of bloody coup. No, he came to power through um, democratic mechanisms and systems. Uh, and I, I think we live at a time right now when our democracy has never been more que been more questioned by more people. And so that was my arrival at Graz, realizing that um, later in my career that I needed to arm myself with more expertise. Uh, and so I was drawn to this, this amazing program that would allow me to continue to be a school leader, to continue to do my work with Facing History and, and ADL. And if I could stay awake long enough to complete a, a PhD in Holocaust studies. So what can I tell you? Uh, the, the, my, in terms of the quality of the professors at Graz, my experience has been exceeded. Um, these folks are so knowledgeable and they're coming from so many different parts of the world. They're affiliated with lots of different uh, institutions along with their incredible work at Graz. And so while I was hoping that would be the case, that has been exceeded. Uh, and, and so the level of training that I've received in terms of methods, in terms of historiography, in terms of understanding of the most important questions in the literature, they've all been exceeded. What I didn't anticipate was the level of care uh, that are, that's offered by the Graz community writ large and my professors um, in particular. I've had the privilege of hiring dozens of teachers and, and I've had the opportunity to try to become the best teacher I could be over 30 years. And in my Graz professors, they've embodied the teacher I want to be and hope to hire. Um, I, when I'm, I'm talking about Ruth Sandberg, I'm talking about Alison Schottenstein, I'm talking about all of these folks that if, if, I had a, if I was having difficulty with a concept or a project or anything, a quick email, and they would be back to me right away, and I'd be on Zoom with them probably within 24 hours. Uh, and you know that level of care has made all the difference. And I know that that's so true for so many of my classmates uh, that I've gone through the program with. The, the other thing I would mention, um, along with what Olivia offered, is the network. The network at Graz is tremendous um, in that you're going to be studying with students from around the world who are range in age or range in experience from sort of early career educators to up, up folks into their 70s, all contributing amazing ideas, life experiences, things that they've learned, backgrounds from which they're coming. Um, so it's, a, it's, a, it's an amazingly diverse place. However, we're all united um, in, in, these, in this work that we're doing together that's never probably ever been more important. So I can go on and on, but I'll stop there. No, you can go on and on, Michael. No, I really, really appreciate um, you, you describing the experience uh, with the details um, that, that you did. Uh, related to what Michael was saying about the, the quality of instruction of Gratz faculty, Olivia, is there anything that you'd like to add about relationships you have with Gratz faculty, um, what, what the experience is like in terms of mentorship, um, I think that that would be really useful to those considering uh, attending grads. Yeah, totally. I I think for me, you know, my my personal experience getting involved with grads was um, I, I got my undergrad in psychology, but I wasn't fully sure what that looked like. And so then when I, you know, happened to look up Holocaust studies, grads was the first thing that came up. And then as I continued searching, I realized, oh, there it's really one of the few places that actually has what I need and what I'm looking for to be able to do this sustainably. And um, so being able to like get in through that avenue, I I really was expecting and was very intimidated by the idea of getting my master's in Holocaust and genocide studies. Um, I really there was a lot of anxiety for me. I felt like I was just going to feel like I was drowning the whole time. And it has, that has not been farther from the truth. The, the it, Academically, it's, it's very rigorous, but I have felt like all of the professors have held my hand the entire way. Um, there has not been a single second where I felt like I'm asking a question that might feel like uneducated. Um, 
I, I've really felt um, incredibly supported. And especially, you know, like there's a couple of students who are even in the DFW Metroplex that I've gotten to be introduced to, which has been um, really, really fun, especially as um, somebody who, you know, I mean, I did two years of my undergrad during COVID, so I didn't get to do much socializing there either. So having that opportunity to like do that a little bit in my master's program has been really, really helpful as well. well thanks for sharing that, Olivia. That's great. Uh uh, I want to remind our, our remaining attendees that you can pose questions for Olivia, for Michael. Um, I'm happy to answer questions as well. So please use the Q&A button or function, I should say, um, and pose any questions that you might have. Uh, can you describe incorporating some of what you're learning at Gratz into your careers? And that's a question for both uh, Olivia and Michael. Yeah, um, for me, I mean, I, you know, at the nonprofit I work for, Passages, we take Christian college students to Israel. And a big part of what they do when they get back is they are responsible for going onto their college campuses and forming bridges of community with their local Jewish community on campus, whether that's a Chabad, Hallel. Um, and so I don't need to tell anybody here right now what the state of anti-Semitism is like on college campuses. But, um, you know, for me, being part of these conversations of, you know, well, how do we equip these Christian college students to be able to go and be better advocates? What does that look like practically? How can we equip them with knowledge? I can confidently say that I would not be able to have those conversations without my education at Gratz. Um, that has been crucial in being able to be well-informed in these conversations and how do we raise up a generation of Christian leaders who are willing to stand for Israel and stand with the Jewish people. Um, and the best way to test them and see if they're good and ready to do that is by putting them on a college campus right now. So, Thanks so much, Olivia. Uh, Michael, anything to add? Olivia, that's great. I think your work is, is so important. As I said earlier today, I, uh, I use my Gratz education every day. Uh, and I'm learning as fast as I can and trying to maximize the resources, people like IL, um, like Ruth, like Ali, and all these different folks about whom I've, I've already spoken. Uh, one of my primary responsibilities right now is I serve as the education chair of the New England ADL Advisory Board. And in that capacity, I'm responsible for trying to help educate I'll help the board to become more and more educated about not only uh, anti-Semitism um, and, and how we're experiencing it, but also who's out there right now fighting the good fight in the best ways. And as as you heard from the lecture earlier this evening and from IL's remarks, we need to come at this, this challenge from as many angles and from as many places with as many people as we can. So I'm... I see my role as one of of trying to build as big a, a, a coalition as as we possibly can, and I and 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 Graz is always there for us. So since I don't know as much as I need to know, I'm reaching out all the time, um, and asking the the Graz network to try to support us in this work, whether by offering resources, by offering their time, as IL will later this spring, um, and. And, and I'm going to continue to do that. I don't know the different roles that it will take within you know, the various communities that I'm in, but I'm I'm so inspired by conversations like this one, and you know, know that my network is going to continue to grow, which is not something I thought would happen at this stage in my career. Uh, so I'm just so appreciative of this opportunity. Well, thank you so much for that, Michael, um, and thank you, Michael and Olivia, for taking the time out of your evening um, and answering some of these, these questions and sharing your grad's experience with, with uh, our attendees. Uh, last chance for any of our attendees to ask a question of Olivia, Michael. And, Could Ezra, I, and I'll just add one, one quick thing in it. Yeah. Olivia, Olivia referenced that earlier, but, but in, in the, the context is slightly different for me, of course, but but very similar. I was pretty anxious after not having been a student for 30 years um, entering the program. And it's it's been so welcoming. And I can imagine if you're on this call and you're thinking about it, you might have some of those you know same butterflies um, that Olivia and I both experienced. I'd be happy to talk to any of you. Um, and you can get my inf um, contact information um, through Dr. Feinberg, but 
uh, or uh, other folks at Gratz, but really any time, um, reach out. I really appreciate that offer, Michael. And I'm certain there will be people that will will take you up on it. And if not, they should, uh, because Michael's an amazing person to know, as is Olivia. Um, so even if you don't have any good questions to ask Michael and Olivia, this might be just a, a great excuse to add to your network. Um, again, thank you so much, Olivia. Thank you so much, Michael. Uh, thank you so, so much to our keynote speaker, Dr. Jacob Scott Lewis, who's on this call. Um, really, really, really appreciate everybody's time and so excited that uh, you guys will be a part of uh, Gratz's community moving forward. Uh, at this moment, uh, if there's any last questions, you can share them. If not, uh, I wish everybody a, a wonderful evening, and I look forward to seeing many of you at our next event, which is at March 12th at 7 p.m. Eastern, that will feature Dr. Amy Hellman. Thanks so much.